Welcome to Virtual Visits at the New York Academy of Medicine Library. I'm Arlene Shainer, the Historical Collections Librarian at the Academy. Normally, I would be welcoming you to the library in person, but since we can't be together that way, I'll be sharing some highlights from our rare book collections with you in this virtual tour. The New York Academy of Medicine began building its library right after it was founded in January of 1847, and we have been open to anyone who wants to use the collection since 1878. The library has over 550,000 volumes, as well as all kinds of other materials, including archives, manuscripts, pamphlets, ephemera, and images. Everything in the collections is here because it tells us something about the history of health and medicine. We also have lots of digital content you can explore from anywhere. Visit us online to learn more about the library and explore our resources. All kinds of things made from chocolate are popular in February and all year round, and not just because chocolate gifts are favorites for Valentine's Day. If you like to bake, you might have a bar of unsweetened baking chocolate or a tin of cocoa powder tucked away in a kitchen cabinet. And if your thoughts turn to hot chocolate after a walk out in the cold on a winter day, you might even have a package of Abuelita Mexican chocolate tablets for melting into hot milk. Or perhaps you've got a chocolate bar on hand for a snack or a bag of Hershey's Kisses. How did chocolate get so popular and where did it come from? In this virtual visit, we will step back in time to look at some of what we have here in the NIAM library that answers those questions. The introduction of chocolate to European consumers has a difficult history. The Spanish first learned about it in the 16th century from the Mesoamerican peoples whose lands they invaded and they brought it home with them. The chocolate they consumed, though, was not the sweetened beverage we drink today, and people argued about whether it was a food or a drink. This 1664 treatise by Cardinal Francesco Maria Brancaccio assures people that drinking chocolate on religious fast days is fine, attempting to resolve the dispute. An ode at the end of the book calls chocolate a heavenly nectar and the drink of the gods, and the frontispiece of the book shows a Mesoamerican presenting a bar of chocolate to the Roman god Neptune, who rises out of the sea in his chariot. Many books about coffee, tea, and chocolate appeared in the 17th century as all three drinks rose in popularity. In this one from 1685, French apothecary Philippe Dufour extolled their health benefits. The frontispiece shows three figures who represent the cultures from which each beverage came. The native figure on the right holds a hot cup of chocolate. Inside the text, he's shown again, with a chocolate goblet at his feet on the left and a vessel for preparing the drink on the right, next to a moulinet for frothing the hot mixture. The cacao plant and a vanilla bean appear below him. A second French text, this one from 1687 and written by Nicolas Blenier, is directly addressed to physicians and touts the benefits of all three drinks for the preservation of health and the cure of disease. Blenier recounts the history of chocolate's arrival in Europe through Spanish conquests in Mexico and gives detailed information about the cultivation of the plant and its preparation. These illustrations show the chocolate paste being rolled out, the big press for squeezing the cocoa butter out of the solid mass, and several different moulinets, the utensils that made the chocolate froth up when it was combined with hot water and other ingredients. Pierre Pomé, chief druggist to France's King Louis XIV, included chocolate in his treatise on the history of drugs, first published in 1684 and shown here in the second English edition from 1725. The best and finest chocolate, Pomé insists, is made in Paris, from quality cacao combined with sugar, cinnamon, and vanilla. He warns, though, that good chocolate and sugar are not cheap. And in another section of the text, he disparages Blenier as a quack who fails to provide any proof of chocolate's medicinal value. Hans Sloan, the British physician, naturalist, and collector whose collections are the foundation of the British Museum, described chocolate in his account of a voyage he made to Jamaica and the West Indies in 1687. As we can see here, Sloan did not find drinking chocolate as it was made by native people palatable, but he's often credited with transforming hot chocolate into the drink that's familiar to us by adding milk and sugar. It turns out this story is just a myth, but that did not prevent companies like Cadbury, founded in 1824, long after Sloan's death in 1753, from selling drinking chocolate branded with his name. 
but sweetened chocolate drinks had already made their way into England by the time Sloan went to Jamaica. This recipe from one of my favorite manuscripts, A Collection of Choice Receipts, which dates to around 1680, contains an elaborate recipe for hot chocolate, which lists the cacao nuts, sugar, other nuts such as almonds or pistachios, and a variety of spices, including pepper, cinnamon, anise seed, nutmeg, and cloves among the ingredients. But the chocolate is mixed with hot water and an egg yolk rather than milk. In the 1730s, the Scottish artist Elizabeth Blackwell published the two volumes of her curious herbal with engravings she made from her own drawings of medicinal plants she mainly observed in London's Chelsea Physic Garden. Blackwell's husband languished in debtor's prison while she worked on her book project, which she published to keep her family financially solvent during that time. Here is Blackwell's engraving of cacao drawn from a specimen in Joseph Miller's collection. While Blackwell says chocolate is nourishing and fattening, she does not ascribe any real medical virtues to its consumption. Here at NIAM, we have one very special item related to chocolate in the library, though, and we'll end this virtual visit by exploring it in detail. Here's the title page for a short book written to accompany an educational exhibit about cocoa and chocolate put together by the Walter Baker Company, which was founded in 1780 and is still in business today. Remember that bar of Baker's unsweetened chocolate from the very beginning of this tour? It was made by the same company. Here's a picture from 1916 of the company's chocolate mills, located in Dorchester and Milton, Massachusetts. But the book was written to accompany this little box, which is about nine inches wide and six inches tall. When we open it, we can see that it contains a tray with four jars that are covered with little muslin sleeves and set into the back of the door are sample sizes of actual chocolate products made by the Baker Company. All of these items have been tucked away now for more than a century. When we slide the muslin sleeves off the jars, we can see that they contain chocolate in four different forms. The whole beans the way they look when they arrive at the factory, the nibs, the cocoa butter that's been pressed out of the nibs, and in jar number four, the final product, powdered breakfast cocoa. The book, which was meant to be used by teachers when they showed the exhibit to their students, contains a detailed explanation of the whole manufacturing process. But here's the quick lesson review as it appears at the end of the first section reminding us of what's inside the jars. And here's a photograph of some of the workers with the chocolate making machines. We can take a closer look at the products themselves. Bars of sweet and unsweetened baking chocolate, a little tin of cocoa, and a bar of sweet chocolate flavored with vanilla. The book contains beautiful illustrations of all the packaging, in case you were not lucky enough to have the display box on hand to show your students. And the text also contains plenty of endorsements, calling chocolate a perfect food, a complete food, and an ideal food for invalids and the sick. Of course, plenty of people would agree that chocolate is both a perfect food and the drink of the gods, but I hope you'll give a little thought to its origins the next time you take a bite. Remember, you can always find us at niam.org backslash library if you want to learn more or do research. <laughs>